headlines and cartoons circulated across Twitter and Facebook, shared by both sympathizers and detractors, either with sincerity or as the butt of the joke. The ideas and imagery from the mainstream press were taken up by or dismantled by memes. And in turn, memes were reported in newspapers, either as something to be celebrated or ridiculed. But the fundamental question is this. Here, in the run-up to the June 2017 vote, we have two main candidates, neither of whom quite fit or approximate the historic template leader. Did the supporters of both try and put normative masculinity on the ballot, on the ballot paper? And if so, what happened? Did they succeed? Or did the very idea of leadership based on the notion of male, of male custodianship run into trouble? Theresa May asked for the electorate to strengthen her hand. Labour Party supporters photoshopped Jeremy Corbyn into images of muscular armed male film stars. Boris Johnson decried Corbyn as having the authority of a wobbly pudding. As you can see on the left, I ran a seminar with Alex Coop and Eleanor Careless in which we tried to recreate the wobbly pudding <laughs> in the midst of the uh, campaign itself. And I can tell you it was very leaky. <laughs> Far more leaky than I realised it would be. Um, Twitter uses crafted memes yes. of, of May as a witch, a robot, a snake or toad or dragon, stealing food from children. The Sun newspaper published comments Johnson made about Corbyn being a threat to national security because he shot blanks. The Telegraph claimed Corbyn was unelectable because he was a passive vegetarian. Johnson claimed Corbyn, called Corbyn a mutton-headed herbivore. And then, in turn, Johnson was portrayed as a grizzly bear and a rampaging monster in The Guardian and in memes. The Daily Mail made out that May was able to offer strong and stable leadership because of her heterosexual relationship. While not explicitly being homophobic, they were also tapping into a cluster of historical associations that unmanned <coughs> men were queer traitors, unstable, uncontrolled, chaotic. While many Labour supporters called May weak and wobbly, fragile or unwell. Through all these insults and aggra aggrandizements, battle lines were being drawn. Battle lines indebted to very old ideas of gender, sexuality, and power. But it was also an election that shattered the media and political establishments' confidence in being able to predict who or what is electable. What might the hung parliament outcome mean for the very patriarchal, militaristic, and heteronormative rhetoric that seemed to dominate the campaign. In order to make sense of how the idea of normative masculinity was used as a stick to beat candidates with throughout the campaign, I will turn to a longer history to expose some of the deeper conceptual logics at play. Normative masculinity is something that hides in plain sight. Like whiteness, heterosexuality, and able-bodiedness, certain identities are considered so normal they often slip into the background. This is, of course, the position where they are the most powerful. 
There is nothing like strongly held assumptions or ingrained frames of perception, because they are once everywhere, structuring the way we think, and yet largely invisible to scrutiny. Normative masculinity has, historically, been imagined as the only subject able to exhibit self-control, and therefore must act as a benign custodian to all those who supposedly cannot. Effeminate men, women, LGBTQ people, those deemed foreign, non-humans, etc. This idea of pastoral care rests on the image of the shepherd and his flock. Despite being sold as the greater good, and those who refuse to reproduce unequal structures of power decried as selfish, weak, liquid, leaky, and diseased. The whole setup is really for the benefit of the shepherd. Take the figure of the male masturbator, for example. Anti-masturbation discourse is a really crucial site for making sense of commonly held ideas of masculinity. Not only does it spell out quite specifically what is supposedly healthy, but also the anxieties and the perpetual fear of failure that haunts it. A lot of the attacks on Corbyn, I know when I found that, I thought, wow. Um, a lot of the attacks on Corbyn were tapping into a web of ideas that once and still associates unmanliness with something implicitly or explicitly queer and also traitorous to the nation. R.J. Brodie's 1845 illustration representing the last stage of mental and bodily exhaustion from onanism or self-pollution bears witness, allegedly, to the devastating effect of masturbation on the male body. A supposed lack of self-control that manifests corporally. The victim is slumped on a chaise longue, body waifish and thin. His form appears impossibly stretched, hinting at a pliable, gelatinous, wobbly pudding composition. His eyes have glazed over, and his hair seems to cling to his head with a dank, damp perspiration. Flesh deathly pale and corpse-like, his right hand appears to be skeletal bone fragments. Published 11 years later, O.S. Fowler's book, Amativeness, makes explicit what we can see here. The male masturbator will supposedly have, quote, black and blue semicircles under his eyes and look as if worn out. He will also have a certain quickness yet indecision of manner. The same incoherence will characterize his expressions. Little things will agitate and fluster. Nor will he be prompt or resolute, or bold, or forcible. Bold and forcible sounds a bit like strong and stable leadership versus a coalition of chaos. Resolute, bold, forcible. These traits about power, strength, and self-discipline are to be found in military masculinity. They were also given as reasons why some subjects should be allowed to govern and some should be governed. In 1875, historian and journalist Goldwyn Smith wrote an article on female suffrage in which he claimed, quote, if power were put in the hands of women, free government will fall. Supposedly, custodianship is situated in the hands. 
This is precisely why May's insistence on her strong hands is particularly complex. She is invoking the figure of the male custodian, which both perpetuates and alters the male custodian as an idea because of her own gender. There were also some mixed messages going on. It was reported that Conservative MPs called the Prime Minister mummy, while in a TV interview with her husband, she claimed that, quote, there were boy jobs and girl jobs. But, as it became increasingly apparent as the campaign unfolded, May seemed to have great difficulty in living up to the very image of bold, forcible, combative, combative confidence that she had set herself. Memes portraying May as a male dictator or as a lad mocked the gap between the public perception of her and her bid for macho authoritarian posturing. Others took a different approach, either turning May's own rhetoric against her by calling her weak and wobbly, or by depicting her as a computer virus, seriously unwell and spineless. Some went further, calling May a witch, a monster, a cold robot, a killer alien, someone who stole food from or ate children. All tropes taken from the Gothic and long used in misogynistic discourse to violently condemn all women who were seen as disobedient. Historically, the, historically, the Gothic as a literary and filmic genre often works to invoke monstrous nightmares in order to slay them over the course of the narrative. Metaphors of contagion and zombie-like decay invoked to call for some kind of containment to be found in the strong arms of a male heterosexual hero at the given plot's conclusion. For a picture of the historic idea of the male custodian, take Frederick Layton's An Athlete Wrestling with a Python. A bronze sculpture produced in the build-up to the First Boer War, which was between 1880 and 80, 1881. With a taut, muscular body, firm, hard, solid, the male figure stands bolt upright. The picture of health. Because health and disease are used as metaphors, ascribed to subjects who uphold or disobey the status quo. The snake, crushed in the statue's arms, has long been associated with femininity, effeminate masculinity and homosexuality, each portrayed as both powerless and yet somehow also an apocalyptic threat to the status quo. Similarly, Corbyn was also portrayed as unelectable and yet also a violent attack on the nation. The Sun ran headlines with claims that Corbyn, quote, might not have planted a bomb, but he, but he made it easier for those who did. Proclaiming, quote, let's nail the lie that Jeremy Corbyn is any friend of peace. The Conservative Party put out posters of Corbyn and a bomb with the caption, Corbyn, no bombs for our army, one big bombshell for your family. So we understand implicitly what conceptual mechanisms May was drawing on when she promised strong and stable leadership and warned of a coalition of chaos. Written a few years after Leighton produced his athlete, Ellis Hopkins' book True Manliness 
circulated in pamphlets issued to troops during the First World War. In it, she claimed, man was, quote, an intelligent being mounted on a spirited horse for him to master. Young men had a choice, either to masturbate, quote, tainting your blood and making it a foundation, a, sorry, a fountain of corruption, turning your body into a charnel house, reeking with the very breath of the grave, or play the man and fight against everything low and beastly. Beasts as metaphors, of course, were evoked a lot in the 2017 general election campaign. To criticize Boris Johnson, for example, Animals are invoked as rhetorical strategies because they implicitly communicate an idea of someone or something without any self-control or self-sovereignty and so supposedly must be domesticated, tamed, caged. Like Leighton's snake, Hopkins horse, or portrayals of mares as snake, toad, dragon, or Johnson's claim that Corwin was a mutton-headed herbivore. In fact, meat-eating has long been associated with military male strength and vegetarianism with female weakness. Essentially, the belief is not only that you are what you eat, but more importantly, to eat something is to exert mastery over it. As a British medical doctor opined in 1898, quote, the potato-eating Irish peasants are kept in subjection by the well-fed English. These ideas sound ridiculous. But the Daily Telegraph literally published an article in the 2017 election campaign, in which it claimed Corbyn's vegetarianism made him passive and incapable of achieving the highest level of political office. This dynamic, powerless threat has long been attributed to those who do not conform to conservative norms. During the First World War, there was a widespread fear among the British public that promiscuous women and homosexuals were working to undermine the war effort. An English, journal an English journalist warned that Britain had been invaded by, quote, German earnings, homosexuals, for the purpose of undermining patriotism. Supposedly, heterosexuality was patriotic. But not just heterosexuality, procreative sex, as Johnson's claims during the 27, camp during the 27 campaign that Corbyn was a threat to national security because he fired blanks, made clear. The binary conception of masculinities that Hop Hopkins describes in many ways still haunts our, con our contemporary political imagination. It divided men into the ideal, healthy soldiers, obedient, selfless sacrifice, and the threat, diseased, out of control, selfish. The former has often been represented through metaphors of solid materials, stone, rock, hardness, while the latter has been associated with contagious liquid excess, or wobbly puddings, as Johnson would have it. These metaphors have long been used in homophobic discourse. In Northern Ireland, the DUP's 1970s campaign to oppose the decriminalization of homosexuality claimed that, quote, 
Homosexuality demands not acceptance, but a cure. The legalizing of homosexuality would open the floodgates. The consequences of such a deluge would be grim. In 2014, a UKIP counselor blamed severe storms and flooding on the legalizing of same-sex marriage in Britain. When TV presenter Richard Hammond claimed that ice cream is gay last year, one can only wonder if he was tapping into a longer historical imagination that pits the idea of the kind of man in an athlete wrestling with a python against the mush and mud of all that threatens to drown the status quo. In the flood, the collapse of firm national and corporeal boundaries. Unmanliness, queerness, contagion, floods, non-procreative sex. They are bundled together under the spectral threat of men losing control, calling forth the muscular, stone-like male custodian's arms of Leighton's athlete to supposedly restore order. Was that call answered in 2017? As the election campaign unfolded, Corbyn grew in confidence, and so too did a visual culture that portrayed him as a heroic figure of muscular military masculinity. People had begun photoshopping Corbyn's face onto macho armed male Hollywood characters back in 2015 and 2016 when he contested the Labour Party leadership. They were first created to make fun of Corbyn's perceived lack of conventional masculinity. Circulated in tandem with claims that he was a bad leader and unelectable, the Daily Mail printed them alongside cartoons of Corbyn as a monkey. But by the 2017 election campaign, Corbyn supporters in both The Guardian and on social media began creating images of him as muscular, manly, and wielding swords or guns. In one meme, Corbyn is depicted fighting a flood of zombies, an image of uncontrollable plague that taps into the very metaphors of disease, deluge, and decay implicated in a historical, homophobic, and misogynistic discourse. Was this simply an attempt to refra refashion the image of Corbyn in the mould of the male custodian? Perhaps to contest his portrayal by Conservatives? Or did it reflect the public's ingrained association between electoral power and normative masculinity? As the polls narrowed, the more muscles he seemed to acquire. Or were these images a joke about Corbyn being attacked for so long, seemingly on the basis of his perceived unmanliness? It is, perhaps, possible for the answer for the answer to, to be all of these things at once. Humour is a space where fears and fantasies can vent under the pretense they are just a joke. But I want to end with a final image that might, just perhaps, picture Corbyn's perceived effeminate anti-war masculinity not as an insult, but actually a good thing. One Facebook meme took a scene from The Simpsons and pasted Corbyn's face onto a luminous, thin, glowing alien. Underneath it says, I bring you love. 
And in response, an armed crowd scream, it's bringing love, don't let it get away, break its legs. Here is the conservative queer terrorist traitor rhetoric that is being laughed at. But so too is the idea of the armed male muscular custodian. See the overly aggressive men in the mob. Perhaps because it was so heavily invoked and fought over during the, the election campaign, the figure of the male custodian was put to a vote and found wanting. That's not to say that it doesn't still exist as a social norm or still holds huge sway in our political imagination. But not only did both candidates fail to live up to or conform to the figure of Leighton's athlete, such obvious displays of this failure also made the idea of the male custodian uncomfortably up for scrutiny. Even the Corbyn memes, whether they were compensating for or making fun of the idea of real leaders having muscular male bodies, are a glaring acknowledgement that normative masculinity is not some kind of benign custodian of a supposed natural order, but stage managed through photo editing tools. The haunting hold of normative masculinity on the British collect collective imagination certainly hasn't disappeared overnight. It is clear that a great deal of people still associate political power and leadership with military masculinity and an out of control, leaky, powerless, apocalyptic threat to subjects who fail to conform to conservative norms. But maybe if the 2017 general election dramatized the failure of the figure of the former figure as a model for politics. The stage is set for rethinking our conceptual templates for who makes a prime minister. Thank you.